we were not created to live stagnant lives, to be stuck, bound, or broken. We were created with a purpose, a calling, a mandate, a mission. Even in these uncertain times, that calling remains the same. To go into the world, to make disciples, to share the love of Jesus. This is the work of Easter. The greatness of God, the power of the resurrection in action. What Jesus did has changed us made us a new creation, given us an unimaginable hope. Grace has taken root. Mercy has flooded our souls. And the promise of eternity has redefined our everything. So why keep all that to ourselves? It's time to put Easter in motion, to make a difference, to share Jesus with the world around us. If your life has been changed, it's time to get to work.
Hey everyone, welcome to McFarland Modern Worship. My name is Pastor Trey Witzel, and it is so good to be joining with you on this wonderful Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers in all of our lives and to those joining us today in worship. We are so thankful for the ways in which you show love and care for all of us in our midst. We have a wonderful worship service today as we continue our Together That the World May Know worship series as we look at the power of shared thinking to bring us together as we discern the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the power of Scripture for us today. Like always, we have uh, communion at the end of our worship service, so make sure you have your bread and juice ready so we can celebrate that holy sacrament. And please sign in. Let us know you're here. Go to the link below. Head into the comments. uh, Let us know you're worshiping there. If it's on Facebook or YouTube or at our website, wherever it is, let us know that you are worshiping with us. And if you have any prayers, uh, you can go to our website, mcfarlandumc.org, and click on the prayer button uh, to share those with us so that we can be in prayer with you. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we continue to sing praises to God. One, two, three. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color I was dead, now I'm living forever I had failed, but you were my redeemer I've been blessed beyond all measure I was lost, now I'm found by the Father I've been changed from a ruin treasure I've been given a hope and a future I've been blessed beyond all measure I am counting every blessing counting every blessing letting go and trusting when I cannot see I am counting every blessing counting every blessing surely
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit into our hearts this morning. We welcome your Spirit into this service this morning, God. We ask that you help us to pay attention and to be sensitive to whatever it is that you would like to speak into each of our lives this morning, God, and help us to be more aware throughout our week and throughout our life. We focus all of our energy and attention on you, God, and we welcome you. We love you so much. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, McFarland. I'm Eve Hawley, the Director of Connection Ministries here at the church. Just today, I was thinking about uh, a few weeks ago, we confirmed in our church a bunch of eighth graders. Uh, they actually went through a class throughout the year to help them uh, talk through and have these great discussions about what does it look like to be a Christian and how... How, what do I need to feel confirmed in my faith? Um, it was a great service. We had around 20 that actually were uh, confirmed. That some were baptized, some joined the church. And we had some family members that were there that decided, uh, you know, we want to be a part of this church as well. We want to confirm our faith by joining the church. So this morning, I just wanted to let you know that we are a growing community here at McFarland and that one of the things that we are about is growing the church and growing your faith. So if you are interested in becoming a part of this family of faith, I encourage you to get in touch with me or anyone here at the church and uh, we can talk further about that. We would love to have you as a part of this community of believers. As we come into this time of our offering, um, I would remind you that you can give by going to our website, McFarlandUMC.org. Um, you can also, if you're watching on Facebook, there should be a link there in the comment section. You can click on that link and go that way or simply mail in a check to the church. So let's prepare our hearts to give and to pray to our great and mighty God who supports and encourages and lives within this body of believers. Father, thank you for loving us. We praise you for you are the God who gives and gives and gives some more. And we see that perfect example of giving through Jesus Christ, whom you sent, who came of his own free will to this earth so that we could know you, we could love you, we could experience your love for us, and so that Jesus could die to pay the penalty for our sins that we might believe and in faith live forever with him in eternity. Thank you that eternity doesn't start when we die physically, but it starts right here and right now when we receive your gift of grace. Thank you that you are the giving God. We can't outgive you. And our giving, Lord, comes from our hearts. So I pray now that as we give of our money, as we give of our time, as we give of ourselves for your sake and for others, that you would receive it with gratitude. We love you, Lord. May your name be praised forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Here now our scripture reading for the day comes from Acts chapter 15 verses 6 through 19. The apostle and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles were here, would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence 
and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God has first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever seen the cartoon of two people standing, facing one another, and pointing at a number on the ground? The joke is that to the person on the left of the cartoon, the number is a six. And to the guy on the right's perspective, the number's a nine. They're both standing there, pointing at the same number, one shouting, it's a six, while the other is shouting, it's a nine. At the bottom of the cartoon, uh, it says, just because I am right does not mean you are wrong. I just haven't seen life from your side. Well, there's a popular response to the uh, response in the cartoon that says, well, wait a minute. One of these people has to be wrong. I mean, someone painted a six or a nine on the ground for a reason. So both of them need to take a step back, orient themselves, see if there are any other other numbers to align with to see which side goes up or down. Maybe there's a driveway or a building to face, or they can ask someone who knows. Now, maybe someone's just ambiguously painted this number just because they wanted to teach a lesson on perspective. But it's also a reminder that we just can't take one perspective as gospel. If we could, there'd only be one gospel, not four. But as Christians, we do look for right and wrong, and what we think about God is important, but just as important as what we think is how we think, with what mindset, with attitudes, and even feelings we think with. In preparing for this worship series, Pastor Rockford introduced the staff to Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist who wrote the book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And in his work, Haidt says that our morality or our thinking can either bind us or blind us. And for today, I want us to think about how our shared thinking either binds us or blinds us. This quote captures the reality that how we think as individuals and a community can either bind us together in strength and unity and cohesion, and how shared thinking can sometimes blind us from seeing a bigger picture, keeps us from seeing either a six or a nine, and then digging our heels in opposition to those who see differently than us. Now, none of that itself is necessarily groundbreaking. Where Height helps informs this series is not by describing that people are divided, we know that, but instead he begins to wonder where our thinking that divides us comes from. In his book, he talks about how the worst idea in all of psychology is the idea that our mind is a blank slate. Developmental psychology has started to show that kids come into the world already knowing so much both about the physical and social worlds they live in, that our minds are programmed to make it easier for us to learn and see certain things, while other things don't come as naturally to us. Nature, the world in which we're born into and raised, provides our first draft of our perspectives which then experiences or nurture, then revises and edits how we think. But in this first draft of how we see the world, Height's research uh, posits that there are five foundations to show how we think and see the world. 
and how we all care and have all five, but just in different priorities. The first foundation is care. We all have a lot of neural and hormonal programming that makes us really bond with others, care for one another, feel compassion for those around us, especially the weak and vulnerable, while we also have very uh, strong feelings about those who cause harm. Our second foundation to our worldview is fairness. Now, in the animal kingdom, there's actually ambiguous evidence as to whether we find this kind of fairness in other animals, but the evidence in people desiring fairness cannot be more obvious. The third foundation of thinking is loyalty. Now, we do see cooperative groups in the animal kingdom, but these groups are always either very small or they're family-sibling related. It's only among humans that we find larger groups of people who are able to join together in cooperation in groups. Unfortunately, these groups are often united by what they are against. This probably comes from our long history of tribal living, of tribal psychology, Jonathan says. Our fourth foundation is authority. Authority in humans is not so closely based on power and brutality as it is in other primates but it's based on more voluntary deference or even elements of love at times leaning towards a desire for hierarchy and structure. The fifth and final foundation is purity. Purity about any kind of ideology, any kind of idea that tells you that you can attain goodness by controlling what you or others can or cannot do. What Jonathan Haidt found is that we all care about these five foundations of thinking, which is great because that means we can all find common ground. But what's difficult is that our psyche prioritizes them differently. And when one comes into conflict with another, when one person sees a six or another sees a nine, our thinking or perspectives conflicts with one another. The good news is that Paul tells us in Romans 8, 5 through 6, that the Holy Spirit can reshape our psyche and priorities, saying, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things to the Spirit. To set the, set the mind to flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. This doesn't get rid of any of the five foundations, but opens up our thinking so that we might together, and as Paul writes in Philippians 2, 5, have the same mind as Christ. One of the ways in which we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to living in peace is by practicing shared thinking. We read in Acts 15 today an example of a community coming together in shared thinking, coming and working together, acknowledging differences of moral foundations, but prioritizing shared listening to the Holy Spirit to guide them in the best way to follow Jesus in their time. Acts 15 is about the Jerusalem Council, where the early church gathered together to discuss whether or not circumcision would remain a mandated everlasting covenant required by God for all Christians, or could the Holy Spirit be moving our thoughts to change? How'd they hear the Spirit? Did they just sit around quietly waiting to hear the Spirit speak and move? We know they did pray and listen, but they also rumbled together, using their foundations of thinking together to discern a pathway forward out of conflict and into community. John Wesley, seeing how the early Christians in Acts 15 and elsewhere engaged in shared thinking, modeled and methodized their shared thinking, in which Methodists have taken to the heart of our shared thinking together. Even though Wesley was widely read in many fields of study and practice, he always described himself as a man of one book, the Bible. Wesley would go on to center his faith and work around this one book, the Bible, while still keeping his, many, uh, th- his thinking informed by so many other areas. 
And from this, we have learned the great value of using what is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral to describe how not only Wesley, but the Apostle Paul and the faithful Christians down through the ages have gone through the thinking to discern God's message, will, and work. The four components of shared thinking or the four sides of the quadrilateral are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. For United Methodists, scripture is considered the primary source and standard for our faith. Tradition is the fire of the faithful, uh, faithful experience passed down from the saints of different ages, nations, and cultures. Experience is our own understanding and testimony of our faith. And then through reason, we bring to the Christian faith discernment and coherent thought. These four elements taken together bring the individual Christian to a mature and fulfilling understanding of walking with Jesus. We see the shared thinking uh, established and recorded here in Acts 15. With regard to scripture, they would have known the clear command from Genesis 17 that says that, that circumcision was commanded by God as an everlasting covenant. Some at this council at Jerusalem were strongly in support of that scripture and other pieces of scripture and the tradition it created. However, by the end of their thinking together, they lifted up a different scripture from Amos 9 that speaks of God rebuilding and setting up something new. A scripture in which they understood to allow that the Genesis instruction is no longer an absolute command that applies to everyone. They were able to listen to the Spirit because of their own experience and the experiences of others. Peter and Paul, Barnabas, they all testify of Gentiles experiencing God and receiving the Holy Spirit and thus the mind of Christ without being circumcised. These experiences showed that God was doing a new thing that transcended the tradition of circumcision. We read of them using reason and engaging their minds in shared conversation and in discernment, debate, or shared thinking and discussion. They were respectful and listening to the stories of God's surprising work as told by Peter and Paul, a necessary part of shared thinking. Clearly, we are to understand how they spent time thinking together. They shared a table together, not walking away where we can imagine at this table discussion about how to understand scripture in the light of both tradition and the new and disturbing yet undeniable spiritual experiences of the Gentiles. I think and believe it is true that what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral was at work in Acts 15. I also believe that it should be at work in our churches today to help us practice shared thinking that enables the church to remain strong and together that the world may know the truth of Jesus Christ. We can also see the power of shared thinking outside the church. Shared thinking is a concept in early childhood development that helps create resilient and creative child, children into adolescence, into adulthood. Now, in the simplest sense, shared thinking in childhood development is best described as one of those moments with a child where everything else around you just stops. You're so absorbed in the conversation or exploration that the act of working together and taking in what you're learning is all that matters. Shared thinking in childhood education uh, is defined as a, a moment in which two or more people work together in an intellectual way to solve a problem, clarify a concept, evaluate activities, or extend a narrative. Both must contribute to the thinking, and it must develop and extend to life. There are some key elements in that definition. The first, working together. The teacher or adult isn't just presenting information to the child to learn. It's a partnership where information flows both ways. It's an intellectual venture 
The thinking can be practical or theoretical, but it should involve deep exploration and coming to solutions or conclusions to build on life. It extends a narrative. Sustained shared thinking can't be a short dialogue, but this moment has to be extended to make sure deep level thinking takes place and that the interaction is memorable and foundational for the child. Now, why does shared thinking have powerful effects? It's because it encourages the very act of thinking itself by valuing and taking the time to understand the child's perspective. It makes the child feel safe to propose new ideas. Practitioners of this model uh, think by demonstrating thought processes out loud. Thought is extended far beyond the child's existing ideas because both parties are sharing knowledge and understanding with each other. But it's not only the child that gains from a sustained shared thinking. There's lots in it for us adults too. It's not just the adult teaching the child, but often in these interactions, it can be the child teaching us because it opens our eyes to the child's potential and prevents us from limiting them. Every so often they will say something that we never knew they could understand or they share experiences that we never knew they had. It opens up our eyes to possibilities and stops us from capping their learning. Isn't that what the church should be like? where our shared humility is strong enough to know that we don't know everything, where our shared worships helps us place knowing God as the ultimate priority, and where we are brought together around the shared table. And in shared thinking, we rumble together in hopes that we might discern the movement of the Spirit as we grow closer together in truth and love. This tradition is not meant to merely preserve the ashes of the past, but to pass on the fire to fuel the next generation of faith. And so may we all be torchbearers of the faith as we pass it on in our shared thinking. Amen. As we enter into this time of shared communion, we remember that the disciples traveled together. It was Peter and Paul, two followers of Jesus Christ, two rocks on which the church was established that disagreed on so much. And yet we would not be here without them, without their shared fellowship, without their shared thinking. And so as we come to this shared table, we are reminded that we need one another, that there is a seat for you and me and everyone, and that together we help the world know this truth. And so, like always, we gather to remember that Jesus, on the night before he'd be betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave thanks to you, Almighty God, and passed it to his disciples and said, take, eat of this, all of you. This is my body. This is my life, which I give for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then as the supper went on, Jesus likewise took a cup, poured it, blessed it, gave thanks to you, almighty God, and passed it to his disciples saying, take drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. This is my love, which I've poured out for you in a new covenant of forgiveness of sins for you and all who drink of it. Forgiveness for the world. Don't forget me. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, pour out your spirit on us gathered here across time and space and pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and juice, this grain of the field, this fruit of the vine, and make them be for us the bread of life, the cup of salvation, so that we might be through them the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. For all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. 
here in the United Methodist Church, uh, we believe that this is Christ's table. It's not McFarland's table, not the Methodist Church's table, but it's Christ's table. And so all of Christ's children are welcome here. So you don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be United Methodist. You don't have even have to be baptized to celebrate in the good and promise of the grace of Jesus Christ. You just have to want to know him a little bit more. And so I invite you, if you're at home, uh, you can serve one another. If that's something you're comfortable with. Um, but I invite us all to take the bread, the body of Christ, to dip into the cup, the love of Christ, and remember Christ's offering for us all. Amen. And now let us join in the prayer that Jesus first taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life. so so
as we go forth from this place and this moment of worship, may we never settle to think we know it all, but may we always go on a quest together to gain a deeper understanding of who God is and what Jesus calls us to do in this moment. May you go forth in peace. Amen.